Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 175 for Monday, July 30th, 2018. Thanks, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, I'm Paul Kent. How are you doing today, Mr. Kent? Dude, I'm tired. I am really tired. I, I had 23 <laughs> gigs in July. Have you ever had a month with that many gigs? Uh, when I was on the road, I did. Yeah. Yeah. But, but not, not in a long time. No, that no. Well, hard work. I'm trying to think how many gigs did I have in July, right? Because I I got it's probably you're doing a couple a day near 20. Yeah, that's the thing is right. Like in in four days, so from Thursday night till Sunday afternoon, I played seven gigs. So that's you know that's a lot. (laughs) But no, I don't think I've done 23 in a month in a in a very very long time. That's a lot, man. And yeah. and my seven gigs only included one loadout this weekend, right? And no load in. So you were loading in and out of every one of those gigs. Yeah, fortunately I've got a bill and you know Bill does the heavy loading in and out and you mm-hmm. know without him without him I don't I there's just no way, but I just, we did I think uh 12 or 14 of these gigs have been house rocker gigs, so you know it's the whole band getting there and and then the rest have been some version of an acoustic thing, but oh yeah, it, right, right, of course. It is hard work, man. It is hard work, and it, uh, yeah, I I, could, I continue to think about my friends who have been professional musicians and do this all the time, and um, you know, it is work. I mean, it's joy, and actually, I can't say for any of the gigs when you're in the middle of the gigs, it's still that same level of absolute wonderfulness. It's usually the next morning when you're feeling kind of sore, like you can probably hear my voice is a little tired today. And, um, you know, it's yeah. fun. It's yeah. fun to play and it's fun to kind of almost test yourself to see if you can actually live that life. Yes. But I'm doing it one month and I'm saying it's tiring. I, you know, I can't imagine a lifetime of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I went through a similar thing, you know, today's Monday. And so yesterday, uh, well, less than 24 hours ago, we finished our final Tommy performance, which was great. Like it, the, 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 the band, the cast, everything really finally, like, I don't want to say finally, but it, it gelled this weekend. It was good last weekend. I mean, I, you know, we talked about it on the show. I was actually really happy with it. And then Thursday night, um, things like just all of a sudden it was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> like it's gone to another level here. You know, we're just, I, I, it, for me, it was Thursday night. I, honestly, from my perspective for the rest of the band, it was Friday night, right? Thursday night. I ended that show thinking, Oh, like I'm just playing these songs now. It's, it was like, this is it's just coming out of you. It's just, just coming out. It's just flowing. Yeah. In fact, I had a moment, uh, speaking of flow, uh, we were we were only like four or five songs into the first set f- first act whatever they're supposed to call it right it's a rock gig so I think I'm in the sets um, and 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 as we were like ending a tune and some of these tunes have like you know big rock endings kind of thing because they're who songs it was Tommy that I was you know playing for and as we were ending this one tune um, I had this thought I, once I share the thought you'll know I didn't act on it but I had this thought of like. That I would, that's very common in the middle of a set bands, you know, locked in, things are flowing. And the thought was, okay, you know, let's change the set list. Like it's time to change the set list. You know, we should, whatever's left on the list, that's fine. But, but like, we can take some detours here and have some fun with this, you you know? And as I said, obviously, you know, I didn't act on it, but it was just really interesting to notice that thought happening at a theater gig. I was like, oh, this is like, we're really just, you know, flowing here. And then Friday took it to a whole other level. The whole band was just flowing. And it just stayed that way through the through the rest of the weekend. That's cool. Yeah. It, you know, and, and we ended Friday night and all kind of looked at each other like, wow, that was pretty magical. You know, that the last, all of these tunes, they're Who songs. So they, you know, they are all big, huge rock anthems because that's what the Who wrote. But the final song is that whole, you know, listening to you thing, which is, just happens over and over again. And it builds and it builds and it builds. 
And it really was magical on, on Friday. And we all ended like, wow, that was amazing. And then of course, you know, Saturday, it was quite honestly, just as magical for the matinee, but because it wasn't the first time that it was magical, it was a different kind of magic, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and we sort of left the stage and everybody's like, ah, oh, well, you know, it wasn't quite the same as last night. It's like, well, it's never going to be like the first time, you know? <laughs> so uh, similarly, we had an interesting weekend. We had a, a gig we've been doing for many years. That's, you know, a sold out gig on Friday night and it was a great party and we played very, very well. And that was really cool. But the gig we had Saturday is actually kind of interesting. And I bring it up because it's very relevant to what you're talking about. We played a house party for the friend of one of our band members. We've been doing this for about 10 years. It's a pool party. We're in the corner of his backyard, cramped in together. Of course. We're we're only miking vocals. Um, The drummer only brings a snare, a kick, and a hi-hat. Okay. And a ride. Yep. You know, literally, it's very, very low-key and casual. We played freaking awesome. And not only did we play freaking awesome, and you could hear everything, right? So that was one thing. We were so loose and relaxed. We took a couple requests. We just kind of, we, and I just bring our song list to that. No set list for that. And everybody just, we just call out. Because people, you know, for most of the time are just, you know, they're socializing or barbecuing or whatever it is. And we're kind of just there. Yeah. And then people, you know, around the last hour, you know, after they've had their dinner, uh, they're kind of more focused on us. And so we played, you know, we, we knew that and we held it out, but we played, you know, a ZZ Top song. We played a Pink Floyd song. We played Margaritaville on request. And, but it was, it was so loose. It was tight. You know what I mean? Yes, I, I exact. Oh, that's, that's the beauty of having a band that's tight is you can be loose about things and, and just move as a unit sort of collectively together. That's yes. yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. And that, that gig that, that kind of almost, I'm not going to call it a throwaway gig, but you know, it's a gig that we kind of do as a favor to one of the sure. guys, and, you know, yeah. um, but we, everyone walked out of that gig just feeling so good. The Sunday gig was just awesome. I mean, it just, yep. and then the Sunday gig, the Sunday gig might have been one of our best gigs in terms of, well, in everything. Now, remember, we we have new material we've been trying to roll out. We have a new band member we've been trying to get incorporated with our entire repertoire. Yeah. Uh, we've yeah. been trying to find the rhythm of the stuff that, that you know, Drop Dead works with this format of this band. Yep. And so there's been a bunch of moving lines. We've had many, many high points. We've, you know, in, and in general... I think we've been about an 88, you know, on a hundred scale. I think that's been our kind of our standard is a really solid B plus night in and night out. Occasional A's, less occasional, but I mean, sometimes yeah. a B, no C's, uh, maybe one C, but, um, but it just felt like everything clicked. And I, I think that that throwaway gig on the Saturday did something for Th- us. Those are the gigs they I, I, I'm sure it did. I've experienced the same thing where, you know, you have the, the, the normal pressure, right? Whatever the normal pressure is, and it's different for every band, you know, you have, you know, the types of gigs that you have or whatever, and there's the normal pressure. And then you finally get the gig where it's lower pressure again, whatever that means, but relative to where you've been operating, you get that low pressure thing and you're allowed to have fun, right? You can take your mm-hmm. eye off the ball, more than you you allow yourself to at a normal gig. And that's when everybody starts playing together. It, I experienced the same thing. I mean, I've experienced it countless times as I've joined different bands or brought in different band members or whatever. It always takes that that lower key gig again. And it's all relative, but it takes that gig for the band to to like pop and become the new band that it is. Right. Yep. And, and but I, I had that recently, it was end of last summer with, uh, with Uptown celebration. You know, we play these private parties, we play these weddings. It's all, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a level of decorum that, that must be kept. Right. You know, and then we played a wedding and I talked about it on the show here, the wedding were the, you know, the first song that were the 15 high guys that were up and dancing in front of the stage <laughs> or whatever. Uh, and it was a wedding, but it was a wedding at a club. And, and so it was, you know, it was definitively lower stress, especially that first set, because we weren't actually playing for the wedding guests for that first set. We were playing because we were set up in a band in this club and, and they required that music be played. So it was like, all right, fine. You know, we'll play like, you, you know, some credence and whatever. And, yeah. and, and just being able to do exactly that play, whatever, 
and just be a band and kind of loose. And, it, you know, we didn't have to control the, you know, here's this and here's that. And, and at this certain time, this needs to happen in the bride and the, what you know, whatever, like all of that was out the window for the, for the beginning of it and turned out was out the window for the whole thing. These people just wanted a rock band and, and that was, that was what they got. But, but yeah, it like those kinds of things, man, those gigs, they sneak up on you. And that's the, I think maybe that's it, right? You go into them, not expecting anything and that's when the good stuff just gets to you, yeah. you get to see it. It's probably always been there, to be perfectly frank. Right. I mean, you know, I saw you guys play and and you were awesome. But you guys. Thank you. It, well, you well, yeah. But you, you know, you show up for for gigs and you're like, oh, we have to you know, there's these marks that we have to hit and you're, you know, right. you're overthinking it. And your then game you just, face is on. Your game face is on. Whereas for something like that, you're like, I mean, it's, you know, barely one step above the rehearsal room. I, and again, I don't mean to downplay it, but that's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you're not thinking at the level that you normally would. And that's, that's a helpful thing. Yeah. If your goal is to have your band operate, Russ has the term one heartbeat, which I love, you yeah. know, you know, it, that's different than, than collections of pros who show up, you know, play great and go home at the end of the night and, and go on to the next gig. I mean, that, that is one path through sure. your musical life. Absolutely. But um, if your goal is to have a band and reach that Nirvana and your expectation is for that Nirvana thing. And it is, you know, it's, and it's different than just jamming, like saying, Hey, let's have a rehearsal and just jam that, you know, that there's a value to that, I think as well. Totally. But, but uh, this, you know, so, so enough people are listening you kind of realize early on that it's, it is very relaxed. I mean, we're, we're dressed in shorts and bathing suits and, you know, flip flops and that type of thing. And, uh, and all of a sudden you can hear, Oh man, we have some really good horn charts. I mean, these guys really play or yeah. oh, I never heard him do that in that song before. That is really cool. And then everybody, your, your combination of relaxed and relaxed enough to, to step out of your box a little bit and do something. And then a Remind your bandmates why you're in that band, you know, why, why you were chosen to be part of this chemistry. And so, yeah, it was just really good. I mean, again, when the gig was coming up on the calendar, it was like, yeah, you know, yeah, all right, right. Here, here we yeah. go again. Yeah. And then yeah. you walk out of it going, that was really fun. The people are nice. We played for, treated us really well. You know, it was three, it was a three to seven gig. You still have your Saturday night after that. Oh, so nice. Yeah, there was just a lot of real good upside. So then we went to Sunday and we played another, you know, music in the park type thing. And um, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm almost to the point of not wanting to do any gigs when there's other bands on the bill, just because getting us on stage. I and say, Mike, that doesn't work for your band. It's I mean, it, like as someone it's who terrible. has listened and I'm sure all our listeners, you know, are, you know, are nodding their heads like, yeah, you you've told this story enough. <laughs> Well, and again, uh, you know, this one was even stacked in our favor because our sound guy was the sound guy for the day. Okay. But, you know, having having 25 minutes to to get us on stage and, you know, luckily, I think, again, because of the good vibes from yesterday, everybody was in a really good mood, like whatever, whatever. I, it, personally, I, you know, I had two incredible prior gigs within ears. I remember I said I was going to. I was going to um, bounce you were gonna on the give in-ears. Up. And I noticed, I saw pictures and there were, your yeah. in-ears were in. I was so happy. Yeah. So, so uh, another friend of mine who's a really well-known sound engineer in town came to see us just because he likes the band about three weeks ago. And he said, you know, for your voice, you might want to try a beta 87. Um, you know, I think it'll bring out some things. And um I was asking around and they were saying, and other engineers were saying, you know, it's kind of hard to push that mic because, you know, yeah. you can't get it too loud in the monitors um, just because of the, the response pattern to it. He goes, that's why you have to get back to your in-ears and, you know, don't worry about it. So we focused on it and I had two great Nirvana-esque gigs where the in-ears were in. I didn't need anything out. They didn't come out and it was just, it was just freaking magical. The but right, this the right gig, vocal mic makes a huge difference. Yeah. 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 That's but, really, but then, I never thought about it in that sense. Like in terms of being able to hear enough that you don't want to pull the ear out, but that's totally true. Huh? Yeah. 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 So, uh, but doing this gig with a, with an opening band and 25 minutes to get on stage and, and get going, uh, you know, I suffered from not having a great monitor, uh, the in ears eventually I had to take them out. And, uh, but we'd made progress, Bill and I, and, you know, at least we, I think we have a good plan going forward for when we have time to set it up correctly. Good. But yeah. So anyway, 
crazy busy July for me. Some cr- really cool lessons learned, some really fun music played, and uh, you know, music's going on. I did want to ask you something. You know, uh, Elvis Costello has taken ill. I'm, I, are you an Elvis Costello fan? Um, I, I, in, I, I'm not a huge Elvis Costello fan. I appreciate his work. I, I, uh, you know, I've obviously played a lot of his songs in, in cover bands or whatever, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, fan. Enough, yeah. enough of a fan. Yeah, yeah. So um, I love Ellis Costello. So, you know, his first couple albums were foundational in my music dictionary, and 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 I and I saw him later in life. Actually, you know, he's kind of he's kind of Van Morrison like in that he goes through phases where he wants to play different styles of music, and he puts together groups that that uh, that do different things. I mean, he's done Burt Bacharach stuff, he's done big band stuff, he's done Americana stuff. I saw him on that Ameri- Sulfur and Sugar Cane tour, you know, was and he reimagined a lot of his great classic material for that style it was really cool to me. But yeah, he's sick and I've been thinking about I don't think I can do a full tribute show to Elvis. Hmm. Um but but you know the songs that I would like to do of his like what songs that you I'm sure you played Allison, right? Yeah, you and I have played that together. That's uh, right. Um, played, uh, um, obviously, Peace, Love, and Understanding, although that's not his yes. song. Um, and we've played Pump It Up. Well, it's a song in that, in that he, he, is, he recorded the most known version of that song. Uh, is that true still? Is Whitney Houston's, the version that appeared on the Bodyguard soundtrack, does that? count for more i had no idea that whitney you, you saying that is the first i've ever heard of that whitney I, I, don't, I don't know if it was whitney houston but it was on the bodyguard soundtrack so i think it was her Whoa. uh here's the here's a here's a so there's this is worth a tangent right we'll come back to elvis costello but i was uh in a small audience it was i guess it was south by southwest or something and nick Lowe, the guy who wrote peace love and understanding yeah. or peace love understanding not and uh was was there and he was talking and, and he it was a great speech, but he was talking about this one point where he was kind of at a, a low point in his life. And he's like, you know, I'm a songwriter. I'm, uh, you know, but I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do for my retirement, like how I was going to pay for being retired. Like how, how could I retire? You know? And he's like wondering, and he's like, you know, I get some royalties, but was it enough? And he's like, so I was having this like, you know, a month of not depression, but you know, kind of feeling low. And he's like, I was in my bathrobe. I walk out to the, uh, the mailbox and I open the mailbox and there's a check from my royalty agency, whatever that is for him for a million dollars. And he's like, talk about a way to brighten your day. Now, you know, you got to imagine that this is all being delivered by a guy from Liverpool and, and so far more eloquently than I. And it was from that version that appeared on the bodyguard soundtrack. And he, and he had forgotten about it. You know, he, he said, oh, I'm sure I'd signed off on it, you know, months before. He's like, these things happen. People want to do covers and I sign off and it's fine. And he's like, but, you know, you don't know that it's coming, especially something like that. Uh, until it just appears. He says, so that was, that was quite a nice thing, you know? And he said, that continued for quite some time. <laughs> He's like, my retirement was all sorted out. <laughs> That's quite a nice thing indeed. Uh, yes, indeed. So anyway, so, so yeah, we played, we played that one together. And then, um, uh, uh, there's a, did we, did we play, um, red shoes together? I feel like we might've. I don't remember did yeah. you play watching the detectives. What's that? Watching the detectives. I've never played that one. All right. Well, there are so many though. Yeah. I mean, less than zero. Welcome to the working week. Allison's great. You know, I don't know. Anyway, Alv- Elvis is on my mind these days and thinking about, I, I think one thing I would do, there is a beautiful version of Veronica that he does a, a acoustic duet with Paul McCartney that I'm going to do with Simon. That's nice. one for sure. Oh, yeah. very nice. He did. Speaking of duets with McCartney, and maybe it happened at the same show, they did a great version of One After 909 together. Mm, um, that's cool. Yeah. My favorite my favorite thing that you and I have ever done together. I love playing and singing One After 909 with you. We, we for, for those of you listening, we do the version that's on the anthology. So the, the straight eighth note version, not the swung, uh, like original version of, of the tune. I rocked. The, the I Beatles, probably, was it the first thing we ever sang together? That's possible. Uh, it, we definitely played it at the first Macworld All Star Band gig at the uh, at the the. Oh no, we didn't do that at the Cooler. 
I, I I feel like we did that at the first Cirque de Mac was the first one. I don't know. I have this memory in my head of of that that place. It just clicked the very first time it we did. played it. It just locked right in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's great. That's great. Great tune. That's good. But anyway, good. so, you know, my message to the world is think about Elvis, wish him well, play his music, get it out there in the ether. That'll, that might be healing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so many great songs to choose from and, you know, such a, a ma- radio, radio. I mean, it's just so many oh, great, yeah, great songs. Yeah. yeah. No, he's, yeah, he's, he's a great songwriter. Uh, great. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I, w- I want to tell an interesting story. So, you know, we had this, we had this seven gig weekend. So we did five Tommies and then two Rocky Horrors at midnight, which meant just like last week, we had a 29 hour period where we did like five gigs. And uh, as an aside, it's really nice to have gone almost, well, it's not quite, I'm not quite there yet. Next week, I'll tell you how nice it's been to have gone <laughs> more than 24 hours without, um, with my hair dry. Um, just being, we were, you know, I mean, I'm playing these who songs and, and so, you know, working up a sweat and then being kind of in the enclosure that we were in, didn't help that any. So it's really kind of interesting just going an entire weekend with just, you know, sort of damp head, no matter what I was doing. But, um, you know, we, we set up and this show, Tommy is known to be cursed. Uh, it, it just, it's a difficult show. It's a tricky show. And there's a lot going on and it's an opera, right? So it doesn't stop except for the the break in the middle, but it just keeps going. And so um, during the first act yesterday, I, uh, you know, it requires just a lot of focus. And I had, I don't know, I dropped a stick or something and was like moving things around between songs and, and eyesight for the blind uh, had started. And that, that's sort of the, la- the, the, that begins the final three songs of the, the first act. It's eyesight, acid queen and, and pinball wizard. And, and then the act, the first act ends. And so, the, you know, we're in the, the beginning of eyesight. It's just guitar and then piano. And then I come in with those, those big, you know, on the, on the floor toms. And, um, and then the vocalist comes in after I do four of those. And so I was, you know, listening and I'm like, oh yeah, okay. It's, yeah, it's almost time. All right. So I put my stuff away. I look at the music. Great. And I, as I'm going to play the first of those and like the sticks are coming down and they are definitely going to hit the drums. Like there's nothing I can do about it. I realize I'm four beat. I'm four bars early. <clears throat> so in, in, in that split second, it's like, okay, well, you definitely going to play the first one here. Cause otherwise it's going to sound like somebody fell down a, a flight of stairs. Cause like, these drums are going to be hit, you know, you, know, <laughs> you got to deliver it. And then, you know, I have like a half a second to think what to do next, because we're on a click for that song. And 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 that means that there are tracks that will be triggered at the right times. But I just gave a cue to the stage that we are not where we, we are. Right. Because I played this thing. And I have to do four of them before the vocalist comes in. So my 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 quick thought, which thankfully turned out to to be correct, was you know what? I'm working with pros. They know that this wasn't correct. If I play all four, they will follow me. Like they will realize, okay, that's where we are. Let's go. I'm just going to go ahead and leave it alone and, and let the next three measures go by. And then I will play four of them in a row and, and the song will be on track where it's supposed to be. And thankfully that's exactly what happened, you know? And I, I, I thanked, uh, you know, Michael at the, at the set break, the singer and was like, Hey, thanks, man. You know, he's like, Oh yeah. He's like, I heard that. He's like, it was kind of interesting. He says, it was sort of a foreshadowing of that, which was to come. And I'm like, so, so awesome. actually, I have, I have questions about this because yeah. here's what happens on stage when someone does something unexpected in my band, or at least mm-hmm. actually, I can't say my band in my head. Yes. You immediately go to what else is going to go wrong? What what else are you going to hear that you don't expect? Yep. But then, then what's in really interesting is other band guys start uh, going through that same process themselves, often with different results. Yes. So, so in a ten piece band, it gets kind of interesting. But once something goes off the rails, I, I just want you to talk with me about when you say they're professionals, they'll get it what did you expect them to get or, 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 or did, are you saying I stopped soon enough for them to be able to interpret that this was just a brain fart. All's good here. All's all's good. That's right. That That's exactly yeah. what my thought process was, was, you know, we've, we've done this show a lot. Everybody knows what's supposed to happen. Everybody is hopefully aware 
Uh, and I had to assume that everyone was aware that what just happened was a mistake. This was a yeah a brain fart, right? And and which is exactly what it was, you know. And uh, and and these happen, and it's you know it's live theater. That's sort of the fun of it. Is it's exciting and dangerous a little bit, and yeah, you know. And so and thankfully everybody interpreted it the right way, you know. But but it's just interesting, especially with the cast because. He, I could see him, but he couldn't see me where he was staged and blocked. So there was no way for me to, you know, like even give him like a little like, you know, we're good. Like that was me. Uh, that's on me. Right. <laughs> you know, stay where you think you are. You are correct. And and thankfully it worked out. But um, but yeah, it was one of those. It was one of those split second moments like, wow, there yeah. is so much that it's not like. Oh, we started singing the verse early. Everybody just follow. It's like, well, wait a minute. Like so much needs to change if we're going to jump four bars in this particular song. Like the click has to stop because the tracks are now going to be in the wrong spot, which which isn't. I mean, it's not the end of the world. We've taught we'd talk that through. And obviously, if somebody like if a vocalist jumped a line or whatever and didn't get back on track, it's like, well, that's what's going to happen. And OK, no problem. But um but, you know, it's like you don't want to have to do that. And so thankfully it, it didn't. So that that was that was act one. And then act two starts. And it's like, OK, you know, final act of this, you know, whatever, you know, five weekend run. I only did like two and a half weekends of it, but still fine. And I was there for rehearsal. So I was there at the beginning and, and, and there at the very, very end, very beginning, very end. And uh, and quite a bit of the middle. So final act, we're going up and, you know, we're even saying like, OK, you know, there's there's still an hour left. Like, you got to keep your game face on. Anything could happen. And the first song of the second act is the Underture, which is my favorite song to play. Now, those of you that don't know the Broadway version, the, the Tommy album version, the Underture is like a seven minute song. And it's the same thing over and over again. And it just builds an in intensity every time until the final time where Keith Moon's just playing like it. There, he, he is not keeping time it, it, for the band. He's just playing essentially a drum solo through the whole song. The mm. Broadway version is just that last time through. It, I mean, it starts a little bit subdued and then very quickly ramps up and just stays that way. And so it's just mayhem. In fact, I think the word that's written in the part to describe how I'm supposed to play is barbaric. Right. So it's fun. It's my favorite song of the thing because I just get to play. The rest of the band keeps time and I just play all over it. And so we we start the song and everything's fine and we just like we're, we get into the first phase of this barbaric part and I hear this racket in my ears because we're all on in ears and, and it's like, you know, I'm playing and trying to figure out, OK, was this me? Like what what Mike picked up this racket? And I noticed there's no longer a microphone on my snare drum. It's like, oh, cool. That's what the racket was. It fell mm. to the floor. I'm like, well, I certainly can't fix it right now. I'm in the middle of, you know, essentially a, a you know, a drum solo for, for 64 bars or something. And, but I did find a moment to reach over I, the, the app that I use to mix the sound for my ears uh, is the, it, it also can be used to control the mains, the house board. Now I have to be very careful not to mess with that ac even accidentally. Cause you know, that's bad for me to be changing <laughs> things in the house, but I know I can do this. So I switched, to the house view quickly and mute the snare mic. Now the sound guy cannot see well, th that level of detail is what's going on with me. So he couldn't possibly know that that mic was no longer on my snare drum. And I'm hoping in my head that he realizes that that is that, that mute light is now lit for a reason and, you know, don't turn it off. And, and as it turns out, he did. He totally interpreted the message. He's like, oh, I figured you, the mic must have fallen off. Great. OK. He says, I saw it and I unmuted it. And then it, the thought went through my head. He's like, no, Dave wouldn't have done this accidentally. And he remuted it. You know, it's like, OK, good. So it took me about five songs of, you know, I'd have like a four measure break here, an eight measure break there and different songs or whatever. And it was like, OK, first I collected all the pieces and it was this <laughs> crazy thing. It's like, OK, cool. All right. Got him. Got to play. Got to play. OK, so play a bunch, you know, then it's like, all right, let's reassemble this. Oh, OK, got to play. Got to play. And finally, I got it back on and it was there for the, you know, for the for the end of the act. And of course, once it was back on, I unmuted it and everything was fine. <laughs> but it was just one of these things. It's like really it couldn't have lasted another hour. Huh? That's cool. That was great. <laughs> I mean, I was going to I almost thought I'm like, well, why am I putting it back on? As soon as this song ends, I'm going to take it off again because I'm taking my snare drum home. <laughs> That's but, funny. Yep. It's just one of those things, you, you know, no matter how comfortable you get, 
And 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 actually, that made things more relaxed for me in that last act because it was like, okay, look, you know, th- don't stress about it. You, you got other things to worry about. Just have fun playing, and and so I did, and it was fun, you know, trying to solve this problem while I'm playing and having to do it quietly and all that good stuff. But um, yeah, it was interesting. kept it uh, kept me on my toes, which is which is good. But it, it also got me out of my head. Like I wasn't focused on oh, nothing this, good happens in there. Yeah. Nothing good happens in there. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. That's the, that's the thing. We talked about that a lot all weekend, that, that whole concept of, you know, don't think so much, just, just concentrate to and do, play. Yeah. 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 Cause otherwise, like you said, nothing good happens in there. Yeah. But it was like, how, how in the world? Why now? Why right yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a lot of band gigs coming up? I mean, how, how's uh, Uptown Celebration doing? How's uh, how's Fling doing? Yeah, I've probably Do, are got, you going to get busier? Yeah, I've probably got you know five or six gigs in the month of August. With um, I think there's th- know, three or four Fling gigs. I can't remember you know where they they sit to straddle the line of the months, and then a couple of Uptown gigs coming up, and and actually some Monkey Fist gigs coming up too. So, and I'm looking forward to that. We have a Fling gig on Thursday night. We're playing. They shut down the main street in our town one summer night every year. And, uh, you know, all the vendors kind of come out and people come out. Yeah. And it's just a, just a good time. Yeah. And so we're playing that on Thursday night, which should be – I'm really looking forward to that. In fact, we um, – I mean, it'll be nice to play a gig where I won't be able to play quite as 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 much as I did at the Tommy gig because you know, <laughs> it's, every song isn't about like the crazy drum part, but um, but I'm really looking forward to singing and you know getting getting playing a gig where I get to do that kind of thing and, and right. again you know, and we just added. It's interesting, you know. We talk about vanity songs. Um, we. Um, there are some songs I, I talk. In fact, I talk about this, you know, our, our bass player Burke and fling is a huge grateful dead fan. And I, I always say how I feel bad for him when, you know, he brings a dead song in because there's no way it's going to match the, you know, whatever the canonical recording of that or version of that song is in his head, some live version, usually with the dead or whatever. We're just not going to get there. And I always feel bad that, you know, it's not quite hitting that mark for him. And, and, and I, for me, I generally won't bring those songs in to me that are that that have that much meaning because I I don't want to be disappointed by them. Right. Mm. And I know that, you know, any given band is going to play any given song and it's no matter what you do, it's going to sound like that band playing that song. And some songs fling is great for and otherwise, you know, other songs just like that's it's not the right lineup to make it sound that way. Sting's um, Bring on the Night Live album that was recorded mostly in Paris, I think, on their on his Dream of the Blue Turtles tour. It's one of those albums that kind of sits on a pedestal for me. It sounds great. The band played really well. And and, and it's the greatest players in the world. It's the greatest freaking players yeah. in the world. Right. <laughs> Let's let us not forget that. Right. <laughs> uh, and so I would. In fact, when I was in the blues band in Texas, we were all we all felt that way. The three of us felt that way about that album. And and we tried. We played Driven to Tears from that album and uh, and Consider Me Gone. And and we learned them. And you know what? We actually played them really well, but it never hit the mark for us. And and we tried them live a couple times or whatever. But it was like, nah, you know what? We're we're doing a disservice to the way we see these songs. So they just fell off the list really, really quickly, even though we we I think we played them just fine. None of us wanted to play him. So it was like, all right, fine. Well, a couple of weeks ago, Mike shows up at fling rehearsal and says, we should play when the world is, is running down. Mm. And I'm like, okay, well, I yeah. might need to veto this out of the gate. And I, you know, I told this, I explained my position on this, like this kind of this, like, I don't think it'll ever hit any mark for me. And I said, but you know what? I mean, it's rehearsal room. Like I'm open, but just know that like, this might not be okay for me. And everybody's like, yeah, fine, whatever. And then we played it. And no, we don't sound like Sting's band on that album because that's that would be impossible. We sound like Fling playing this song. But it works way better for us than I ever imagined. And mm. the groove works like that. That's a that's a great groove. Either version of that song, because the police did it very differently than than the way Sting did it live. And and our version is yet, you know, kind of a third interpretation of it. Um but uh, but it works really well, like so much so 
that I'm excited about playing it. Like it's my That's new really cool. favorite song. Yeah. Yeah. Mike sings the heck out of it. We've got a nice groove happening. There's a good little solo. We've added some little flourishes here and there to make it interesting. And, oh yeah. Like I can't wait to play it at the gig, which is great. So the deconstruction of that is interesting because I, I'm on the same way, you know, like I'm picky about my Springsteen stuff yep. and there's, and, and the, this is not even on a level of technical requirement. No, it's not technical. Sing, right. But it's a sound you have in your head. And that's the thing. When you pick those reference recordings, live or recorded, harder, you know, studio albums because of all the wizardry that mm-hmm. goes into making something like that. But even that Sting album, you know, remember, A, some of the finest musicians in the universe. And yeah. what you're hearing is is And even those their- musicians say it was like magical. Like that band was the best band in the world and will always have been the best band in the world. Like they, they know that they'll never hit that mark again either. Right. And that's the thing is, <laughs> is the, what you hear is a combination of several things. One is the uniqueness of what's in those musicians, hands, breath, you know, yeah. whatever that, that makes the sounds that they make the chemistry of those remarkable musicians, some pretty amazing technical wizardry that's in the live and recorded sound gear that, you know, makes it sound a certain way that resonates with you. Exactly. But it is interesting that, that, uh, once you can divorce yourself from that yep. and get back to the essence of the song that you like, and then find something in a song that your band can, you know, add something to or bring to life in a unique way that feels good to you. That actually is kind of rewarding I, because trust me, I get, I get, you know, what Burke must feel with, with his grateful dead stuff. I feel this stuff with several rock and roll things and, uh, we play a lot of good rock and roll, but there's some stuff that I really like to do that never, you know, and it's, it's not all about technical proficiency. We tried to play the Detroit medley. Yeah. You know, kind I of a rock that. standard, right. right? Yep. Yeah. It is cacophonous when we play it, you know, and even, even when we listen to us playing it and talk about it being cacophonous, it's just the subtleties that make even a great rock and roll record, even a great fifties or sixties rock and roll record there, you know, it's hard to play simple. That's one thing, you yeah. know, it's hard to really let space in when it's a simple tune. Um, the, te- the, the, the temptation overplay, but it is kind of a cool thing when there is that song and, and you're, you're convinced it's not going to work because it's on this pedestal. And then your group of guys find some magic in it. Then all of a sudden, it's almost the irony that this thing you said would never work is now surprising you and bringing you delight and joy. There's, there's just some magic in that. Oh, totally. And, and, and the nice part is, you know, like I was able to experience exactly that joy and simultaneous with that, the irony of it, because I, I, I knew coming in and perhaps it's because I was so aware. I mean, we've talked about it a lot on this show and, and all of that. I, like I knew going in, that there was no way we were going to hit that mark. And, and somehow, like you said, I was able to detach from that and, and let that be its own thing. And, you know, our, when we were, when we were learning tempted, the squeeze tune, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, that's another one that like really hard to, uh, to, mm-hmm. to get right. But fling is actually the right band in the right lineup to do it. Like we have the right vocalist and Aaron and, and we've got the harmonies, right. And everybody like, it's the right band and, and, and we actually do it just as, but Aaron's comment as we headed into this, he, you know, he was really hesitant about it for all of these reasons. And he said, you know, the, like, as we're getting ready to decide whether or not to play this at a gig, we must remember, you know, do no harm. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's, a, that's a good way of looking at it. Like you're not going to, if the goal is to make it perfect, then failure is, is, you know, assuming <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's imminent. Certainly. Yeah. If not already behind you, but uh, do no harm is, is a, you know, is a good, useful. it's useful. Right. It's like, okay, we're not doing this song harm. Like I, I still like, I love this song and, and I love the, the way we do it. Um, and of course that could change. We could get much, it could be much worse than I think it is. And, and, we, or we could test it out, you know, road test it on, on, um, uh, on Thursday and, and quite specifically road test it since we're literally playing in the street, but, uh, and it could, be, <laughs> it could be a disaster, right. But, um, but we'll find out. I don't think it is. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty certain that, 
uh, at least the way we've played it thus far is not a disaster. So it's like sometimes you play a song. Often you play a song, but sometimes you need to let a song play you. You need yeah. to just kind of let it flow. And Tempted is a is a really interesting case study on because you know the changes are crazy. Mm -hmm. The groove is delicate, right? The the delicate. vocal, yeah, yeah. The vocal styling is is has its own thing, and you know, you, yeah, you, you can't, can't make that up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you, that's, that's, I get the do no harm. That makes a lot of sense to me. You just got to like inhabit the song and let the song play you, you know, you, you, you the changes are numerous, but not hard, nope, and, but that's right. But, yeah. but you can't be late on them. Right. And you no. can't, you know, there's no room for mistakes and tempted. Like there's nowhere to hide if you make a mistake and tempted. Nope. Nope. And the other song we've been playing with, which again, you know, similar on the list for me, these three songs is Blue Oyster Cult's Burning For You. Um, I, again, a, a, in my mind, one of the perfectly crafted pop songs out there. Uh, and it's a weird one, Burning For You is. But it's got great vocal inflections. It's got great changes. Um, the, the, the stylistic changes throughout the tune really kind of make it. And you need to, like you said, you can't be late on those. You need, everybody needs to be right there on it. And, mm -hmm. um, and then, and then there's the vocal delivery that just is, there's no room to, for error there. It just needs to be what it is. But I think we've been doing a pretty good job with that one too. We might road test that on, on, uh, on Thursday as well, but yeah. So I'm, I'm yeah, obviously looking forward to, you know, these upcoming fling gigs with, um, you know, with some of these new tunes, we've got some originals, cool. obviously. Yeah. 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 Just so. keeps things fresh, you know, it just totally. fun. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Man. Well, good stuff, man. Yeah. We're house rockers have one more month of crazy busy. We have, I think we have 12 gigs. And so I have another 23 gig month in August. Mm. And so, you know, it'll be interesting. And uh, <laughs> then it tails off a little bit in September and then, you know, kind of gets back to normal life in, in October. And, uh, but, you know, you kind of get to that place where you're ready for the break, but, um, but if it's going really good, you kind of don't want to stop it. You know, you kind of like want to ride it a little bit more once yeah. you work so hard to get to that place. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that it, it's interesting. I had that thought about Tommy this weekend where it was like, oh, wow. You know, the band's playing really well. Like, you know, this is great. We're just firing on all cylinders and, and everything's going really well every show. And I thought, you know, that's this is the right weekend for this to end because it, it the set, much to my my guts. Uh, chagrin, the set, the set list will not change just because we're feeling good. You know, it's going to be exactly the same every time. <laughs> mm. And, and, you know, we're still able to be loose with it and fun with it. And eventually we will get over the excitement of having gotten it to this point where it's, you know, that, like you said, we can sort of move one heartbeat and, uh, and it was like, no, we should end. And, and I really felt, I mean, it, it was, there was a, you know, a bit of sadness or whatever as it ended, but not really. It was more, especially when we, you know, we played that, that last, um, that last finale there as it just built and built and built, it felt, you know, I had this feeling of, of, of being triumphant, like, okay, we got it here. Like, Conquered, awesome. Yeah. We, yep. We got here. And then the bows, we essentially play pinball wizard, um, uh, with, with just instrumental and everybody takes solos and stuff, keyboard player and you know, guitar players take solos as during the verses and all that. And, and that felt like our victory lap. It was like, okay, cool. Like we did this and, and now we, you know, now we get to have a little fun and, and then let's pack it up and go home. <laughs> well, just, just to have a little fun with it. So yeah. let's say the musical director walks in and says, listen, uh, whatever you guys want for walking music today, set the stage, do a good job. Yeah. What three who songs would you play to, to warm up the crowd? Uh, the seeker would be one for sure. Great one. Yep. Um, since I can't pick something from Tommy, I can't pick pinball wizard, but that's, that's one of my favorites to play as you know, but, uh, but we'll stay off of that. Uh, Baba O'Reilly would yep. be one. And we talked about doing and even singing Baba O'Reilly as a band um, for outro music, but it never, it, it never materialized. So it'd be the seeker that, and huh, what would be the last one? I don't know. There, there's so many to choose from. You have a horn section? No, not for this. So 515 is, is off the list. Otherwise yeah. it would definitely be there. Maybe, um, maybe who are you? That's a fun one to play. If, if yeah. you've got somebody that can, like, if you have the right vocalist, that song is a blast. Magic bus. 
Magic Bus is good. It, Squeezebox is fun. I've played Squeezebox yeah. a bunch. That's good. Yep. And for walk-in music, maybe Squeezebox is a good one. You know, and Magic. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good. We'll play cool the Seeker stuff. on uh, on Thursday night for sure. We, we, that's that's a good one. Now now that you mention it, it's like all right, that's going on the list. And pin, we love that guitar solo. It. Love that guitar solo. Yeah, that's, that's the epitome of of Townsend's rhythm based lead work. It's just it's a, it's a fantastically melodic solo. It, Absolutely it is perfect. Nut it's song. perfect. Yeah, and and we don't even try to. Uh, to, to come closer you can't well i mean i like i don't know like i guess you could but i i much prefer to play like the rush version of that song they they did that whole album of covers that they called feedback i don't know 15 years ago or something and they put uh it, it, that, that's actually a great album they've got some some great covers on there but but they did a cover of of the seeker and and so i always just think of that as our rush song since cool. we probably won't play any other rush songs and, and and then the guitar solo is just a guitar solo i mean not that it's a bad guitar solo but it's not it's not that iconic guitar solo. <laughs> yep. 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 So cool. All right. Well, we rock on summer we dog days of summer. We're rocking on. Yep. That's what we do. That's how, uh, that's how we keep it happening. All right. Well, that's what I got for today. We, you, Me too. We good. All right. Sweet good, man. Good catching up, bro. It was great to catch up folks. It was great to catch up with you. In fact, we want to hear from you. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Please find us, send us, tell us, just tell us what you think about the show. And then if you got something to, to add or ask or whatever, let us know. Do you have anything to add or ask, Paul? I just have one thing to add, and that would be always be performing. <laughs>